Here we are, the ninth year in a row of a new Jackbox Party Pack. A collection of five party games designed to be played with one screen while every player opens Jackbox.tv in a browser on their phone, tablet, laptop, or whatever else they have. They're always great for big groups, and it's super easy to host remotely. If you're interested in that, I recommend checking out the official documentation or Jackbox tutorials on their YouTube channel for lessons on how to set that up. How's it going everyone? My name's Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This year we have the return of the classic bluffing-based trivia-ish game with Fibbage 4. Every other game is entirely new to the series. Rumorang is basically if you turned Big Brother into a party game, with an emphasis put on role-playing to win favor in the house and come out on top. Junktopia is a word-based game that mostly comes down to being the funniest in the room. Non-sensory combines writing, drawing, and guessing. Each player must craft an answer to target a specific placement along a set scale, and every other player tries to guess where on the scale that answer was intended to target. And Quicksort is a trivia-based game that's all about sorting answers based on the given start and end point. Players are split into two teams, working within your team to debate and argue towards what you believe to be the correct ordering. I'll review each game individually and summarize the pack at the end. I'll also rate how well each game plays in person, remotely among friends, or with strangers over a live stream. And I will tease now, I believe there are zero outright stinkers here two weaker games, and three absolute bangers. First up, Fibbage 4 made for two to eight players. For a few years now, each pack tends to have one sequel. At first I thought, Fibbage 4? Until I realized it's been five years since the last Fibbage. So from the perspective of longtime fans who have maybe exhausted the included prompts in the past Fibbages, it kind of does feel like the right time to bring this one back. Everyone is presented with a piece of trivia, a historic anecdote, or some other question with a word or phrase excluded. And there are two stages with each presented prompt. First the lying, and then the guessing. For the lying, every player must submit their own answer for what that blank space could be. The goal here is to craft a convincing enough lie that other players will select it during the second phase, which is the guessing. During this portion, everyone's submitted answers are presented alongside the truth buried in there somewhere. This will be familiar to anyone who's played past Fibbages. You will earn points both by having other players guess your lie, or by selecting the truth from among the lies. In round one, you get 500 points for each person fooled, and a thousand for finding the truth plus an extra five points for every like you were given simply for giving a funny or intriguing answer. Round two plays out the same, except the points are doubled. With each incarnation of Fibbage, we've had a revised final Fibbage round. Here the point values are raised yet again, but the mechanics of it are always different, and this might be my new favorite iteration of the final Fibbage round yet. Everyone is presented with two prompts, with one blank each. Now. These two prompts have two separate and unrelated truths. The trick is that you only get to submit one lie that's intended to apply to both. You're trying to capture guesses from the other players for either prompt, ideally both. It can be really tough to bridge that gap and submit something that could realistically apply to either or. You may be tempted to double down and submit one really strong answer that clearly only applies to a single question. However, you are rewarded extra if you manage to fool people on both sides with a 1000 point double deception bonus. It takes some really clever lying to come out ahead in this one. It's more of what you know and love, and the final round is great. I truly enjoy the quick stats at the end. Who had the best lie? Who got fooled most often? I honestly wish there were a few more, I just don't really have good ideas of what they could be. In addition to all this that you're already familiar with, there are a few new question types. The Jackbox team asked fans to submit questions where almost anything can go. 
or the selections from Cookie's VHS vault, which I'm glad that Cookie the host is back, he's always a riot, where you're shown clips from these old, old movies to inspire questions. I think it's a funny way to shake things up, but I've seen some diehards who aren't a fan of the new question types. Unfortunately, there's no ability to turn that off. I think that would have been a simple inclusion. There are also intended to be themed episodes if you want to zoom in on a particular trivia subject. I think this is the best version of Fibbage so far, which is why it's such a shame that they seemingly didn't even try with the return of the Enough About You mode. This was first introduced in Fibbage 3. The idea is that each player is posed a question about themselves. Then everyone else makes up lies and it proceeds as per usual. This was a really good alternate game mode that was a great icebreaker around new people and that you could get a lot of mileage out of with different combinations of friends. Once you've seen a Fibbage prompt before, odds are you'll remember what the truth was the second time around, so Enough About You was always fresh and unique. But this time around, there's only one round. Each player is given two prompts, you answer both truthfully, everyone crafts lies, you do your guessing, the end. Maybe they wanted it to be this incredibly fast and to the point, but there is nothing here spicing it up. No round two, no unique take on the final fibbage, no playing on the concept of personal truths and lies. It still has value and is bound to be good for some laughs, but it feels super half-baked to me. Across the board, Fibbage works well through all means. Obviously, Enough About You is never meant to be played with strangers, so I don't count that against it. You do actually kind of need to know each other and have the live discussions for that to work at all. Way back when, for Fibbage 3 and the newly introduced Enough About You, I gave it 10 out of 10. It was everything it needed to be. This was nearly that as well. I love the new final Fibbage. I think the new art style is really fantastic. But the fact they tacked on and seemingly forgot about the Enough About You mode brings it down to a 9 for me. Just shy of that mark. Next we have the new game, Roomerang, made for 4-9 to nine players. This is a game built around role playing. When starting the game, everyone is assigned a random personality trait. And I do appreciate you have the option to craft your own if you so choose. Answering prompts to win over your housemates and avoid getting eliminated. Don't worry though, if you are eliminated, you still get to participate. You come back with a new look, a slightly corrupted name, which is pretty funny, and a new personality trait. So hopefully if you are just struggling with the one you started with, you'll do better the second time around. I do almost wish there was a permanent elimination mode. I feel like they could have spiced things up for groups who prefer more cutthroat gameplay. Once everyone has joined the house, they are allotted 5 points each to start. This game plays out across five rounds. The general idea in each round is that everyone will be presented with a prompt and must give an answer, attempting to do so in character. The other players, and the audience if there is one, select their favorite answers. Everyone receives one point per vote received. The winner, whoever had the most votes, also receives a bonus, which can range from immunity during the elimination, giving immunity to another player, having their elimination vote count for double, or literally outright choosing who is eliminated, which honestly felt very overpowered. Players are removed from the house through a majority vote. They lose as many points as they had votes cast against them. And if your vote aligned with the majority, you'll gain one of those lost points. I also like the inclusion that this person is then allowed to share some parting and often spiteful words on the way out. I was hoping there was more variety in the rounds themselves, but the five rounds always play out in this sequence. The first round is all about introductions, where you tell your other housemates about yourself. The second is the connection round, where you are paired with another player, where you're intended to either cater your answer to them or riff off their personality trait. The third round is a quickie, which is done anonymously. 
I did like that there was some strategy here, that if you felt your trait was limiting your answers, you could borrow from someone else's and try to steal away a few votes. The fourth round is the fire starter, where you basically try to start beef with another player. And in the final round, everyone votes on who they think should win and who they think shouldn't win. Points are tallied and the winner is crowned. Now. Because this is all role-playing based, it does work equally well through all methods, since actually knowing anything about the real people playing doesn't matter as much as their commitment to that assigned trait. However, debating who should or shouldn't receive a vote to be cast out is slightly more fun when you can actually converse, but it still mostly works through a stream chat. When I booted up this pack, people in my own stream were so excited for this game and claimed it was their favorite. I think it's because it allows anyone to so easily take part. It doesn't matter that you don't actually know each other, but this one just didn't really do it for me. I think crafting four separate jokes about a single prompt has diminishing returns. People I've played with did manage to do it well and I applaud them for it, but I mostly found it tedious. It's the same reason I've never really enjoyed TKO. A new shirt is zany and funny the first time, and less and less funny every single time you're forced to look at it. So at least you're crafting unique responses every time, but I think if they were going to recreate a game show kind of like Big Brother, why not include some mini games that are a classic part of reality TV? It's one of the most fun parts of Trivia Murder Party, and considering that game is not a part of this pack, there's absolutely room to tie it into something like this. I would prefer six rounds, structured with the introduction, and then your first prompt same as before, then insert a mini game, then the second prompt, probably the anonymous one again, another mini game, one last chance to stand out, and then the vote. It'd take a bit longer, but it'd feel more like a reality show, while providing alternate means to earn points. It would also act as a nice pace break from typing answers, create a little bit more variety in this pack, and stop it feeling quite so repetitive to make your fourth joke in a row about hating exclamation points. I think sometimes those wells run dry a little quickly. More than almost any previous Jackbox game in any pack, it feels clear that this just isn't for me, not that it's a bad game. I just think the wasted potential of the concept is so glaringly obvious. It's a 6 out of 10, I did not hate this game, but I still found it to be the weakest in the pack. Junktopia, made for 3 to 8 players. When starting, you're presented with three strange objects, and you must choose to buy one of them. The three objects represent three separate price points. You can mitigate your risk by going in cheap or splash out for the more expensive items that have higher profit margins. When you buy an item, you can also choose to haggle. This is a random coin toss of whether you get a better or worse deal on that purchase. I wish there was more to it than that, it's not a very complex mechanic. Once you have your item in hand, you must write a name for it and two interesting details that make up its backstory. Both the gameplay and art are very similar to Joke Boat, a game I fairly strongly disliked. However, they did fix some things here. You have the freedom to either use their suggested prompts to get the writing juices flowing, or to write something from scratch. In these examples here, the black text is something that the game gave you as a starting point and the red text is what the player filled in. Alternatively, 100% red text means they wrote it all themselves. So, I greatly appreciate having those options, depending how many ideas come to mind for your object, and not painting the player into a specific corner. Junktopia then pulls from games like Patently Stupid or Talking Points, where you can choose to present yourself, maybe add some flair or salesmanship, or allow the game to auto-present for you. After a group of items is presented, they are put in front of players in pairs, where they choose their favorite from each pairing. Each vote given in those head-to-heads equals $1,000 added to the winning item's final appraisal. When scoring that round, add up $1,000 for every vote that player received, and subtract what they paid for it. 
a second round then plays out in the exact same way. The final round is kind of a funny way to put a cap on things and bring it to a close, as you must now come up with a single title that unites your pair of items as if they were a part of some collection. Everyone picks their favorite, with each vote giving that player another thousand dollars. And at the end of all that, the player with the most money wins. This game takes a while to get going and has quite a lot of downtime. Back to back to back, you're choosing items, then naming them, then giving them the backstory. It's not unbearable, but it can drag a little for sure. I feel Junktopia will appeal to the same people who liked things like Quiplash, through the ways it rewards players for being funny or clever. And it will appeal to people who enjoyed those presentation style games, as it can be funny for those reasons as well, especially since the objects themselves are rather strange. I found this one definitely worked the best when you were with other people and could hear each other's full presentations. And I found in my own stream that with the delay between myself and the audience, everything sort of fell apart, making it kind of excruciating to get through. Because your phone is always up to date and live while the stream in front of you can be as much as 10 seconds behind, they are being told on their phone to cast their votes while presentations are still ongoing. Even with the extended timers turned on, it really just didn't work, and so people frequently missed their opportunities to vote. I don't stream that often, so maybe my latency is just especially bad, I'm sure others who are professionals at it could make that work. But my main gripe is with the concept itself. All this emphasis was put on buying and reselling this junk, when really that initial purchase only makes a difference of a couple hundred points. Why the heck didn't they merge this concept with Bidiots? Say you're playing with six players, present them with something like eight or nine objects. Then have players start with a set amount of money, bidding on the object they want to start with, driving up prices against each other. Then the haggling's not even needed since it's basically useless anyways. Maybe you get away with spending less than everyone else on an object they were scared of selecting because they couldn't think of anything funny to go along with it. Then after your purchase and once you've added the names and backstories, then play out the same game. The key here is not to show what everyone voted for during the presentations. Then bid on them once again. Make players guess which ones they think rose in value. Pit people against each other. Have someone try and pawn off their garbage item that didn't get any votes. Try to sneakily get the minimum bid in on something that you thought was really funny. The potential of this game feels even more obvious to me than in Rumorang. It's a functional game. I really like these weird objects and the idea of running these presentations. But as it is, it's kind of just another entry in their ongoing series of who's the funniest word games that pretty well every time fail to be as entertaining as the simplistic quiplash. Measuring your points and money, buying and selling, these gimmicks are way too underexplored for Junktopia to stand out. The existing content of the game is kind of funny to me, I enjoy the style a lot, the folksy spooky music is really great, but with a fairly poorly executed main hook, I can only give it a 6.5 out of 10. And with that, we've actually already gotten my two least favorite out of the way. And now, I can move on to my two favorites in the pack. We have Non-Sensory, made for 3 to 8 players. First off, is this the first Jackbox game to make full use of 3D art like this? I think it is. I like when they revisit old art styles, but it's always fun when they introduce something new. And come on, Professor Nanners, what a great character. This is it. This is the standout game in the pack. Non-sensory includes writing and drawing elements in really clever and unique ways. It even ties in some group psychology that's insanely fun to see play out. And it works equally well across any means of playing the game. Round one is writing based. Everyone will be given a prompt and a scale. More than one person may receive the same prompt, but they will not be going head to head. For example, player one may be given, how afraid of ghosts is the person Person in this dating profile, and be told that they need to make a placement on a scale of not afraid to afraid. Here, player one was told to aim for a six on that 10 point scale, and wrote, I'd like to date you, but please don't haunt me if we break up. 
I could interpret that this person clearly believes in ghosts, but is still willing to put themselves out there. We all ended up guessing a little too low. And as you'll see, players earn points based on how close they were to the correct answer, with the submitter also earning points through others guessing in their correct range. So it incentivizes the person submitting to attempt to land on the scale accurately. Another player was told to write a 10 on that same scale and simply submitted, ah. After a burst of laughter, we all guessed a bunch of 9s and 10s way at the top, which was correct. We then get to dissect the player's rationale that the person who wrote this hypothetical dating profile was too afraid to write a profile at all and simply screamed. When submitting your guess along that scale, you have the option to double down, risking the loss of points if you're way off, in the hopes of doubling your points if you get it dead on, or plus or minus 1 on that scale. Round two is the same idea, but with drawings. How wealthy is this clown on a scale of poor to rich? Or how exhausted is this stick figure on a scale of wide awake to very exhausted? Points are earned in the same way, and the double down option is still available. Now, the final round is still drawing, but instead of crafting something along a scale of 1 to 10, there are now two distinct endpoints that it's weighted somewhere in between. You may be told that the two ends are dog and dinosaur, and you must draw a picture that is 70% dinosaur and 30% dog. This can get truly insane. One of the ones we saw was merry-go-round and wedding cake? You would think that that's not possible, yet the guesses worked out fairly well. Or one of the favorites I saw was when someone was told to draw on a scale of hand to foot, but the result they were told to strive for was to draw 100% hand. These results are hilarious and the possibilities are endless. I always enjoy creative games like this. It's not necessarily about being most funny, it's how well can you communicate the idea you're presented with. The game is fast, easy to understand, pretty well endlessly replayable, and sparks some hilarious conversations while debating the nuances between a text message being a 4 out of 10 or 5 out of 10 romantic. One annoyance that did come up is that the lines you draw on your phone don't carry forward precisely as you drew them. They're stylized very slightly with these wavering thicknesses, which could then result in some incomplete pictures that aren't really how you intended. It left players questioning, did you intentionally draw your stickman decapitated? Or when you're trying to convey the nuance of how mean a stickman is, and you place your lines just right, undoing, drawing, undo, draw, undo, draw, there it is, perfect, and then it appears other than how you drew it? I feel like there was really no reason to have that, and it can be kind of frustrating. But overall, it worked equally well across all methods of play. You can tell Jackbox really did try to make sure that was the case in this pack, even if it didn't quite work every time. But I think this is a game that anyone could enjoy, no matter how you're playing it. Nonsensory is a 10 out of 10 for me, and might be one of my new all-time favorites. I thought about knocking off a half point for that weird line translating thing in the drawings, and maybe that'll end up bothering some people more than me, but it wasn't enough to subtract from a game I just truly loved. The rounds are distinct yet equally fun, the final round switches things up in a meaningful way, and its rules are simple enough that anyone should be able to pick up and play very quickly. This is everything great about Jackbox. And last in the pack, quick sort for 1 to 10 players. I like the idea of including a game you can technically play solo, challenging your trivia knowledge. Or you just go head to head against a friend. It's nice to have those options. In this trivia game, the players are split into two teams, and the gameplay involves sorting things as they fall from the ceiling in a Tetris-like style. If Tetris only had one shape of block. It's as simple as that. After selecting either a given or mystery category, you will be told in vague terms what the two ends of that spectrum are, but not what actually represents the start and end. That doesn't matter so much when it's something like putting the confusingly named Fast and Furious movies in order, but has a much more fun sense of panic and poor decision making when it's something like Animal Heights. You'll see a deer come down and 
think, yeah, that's a mid-sized animal, then nothing smaller ever falls after that. You're now left awkwardly stacking and arranging things based on that single impulse decision, trying to line them up perfectly within the limits you set for yourself. While you are on a team, it's just one player at a time in control, so you'll be sliding to the left and right trying to determine that final placement while everyone around you argues about whether that's right or wrong. This is hilarious in person or on a call, but pretty non-existent when streaming with strangers. And stream delays are bound to make that a bit of a nightmare. A block will be halfway towards the bottom before someone realizes they're in control of it. There is a real-time block positioning image representing what's happening on your phone screen to help compensate for this, and while I greatly appreciate the effort, it only partially mitigates those problems. It's better than nothing. And that's about it. You get points based on getting correct orderings and for achieving streaks. In the second round, fake answers will also be included that must be thrown in the trash. Just be sure you don't block the trash, or else you'll be in some serious trouble. Luckily, there's a bin on each side. Also in this round, you will be told which streaks you found and have a second attempt to solve things, then correcting your mistakes with those streaks left intact. I actually like that they went this direction instead of having a proper third round. It comes down to how well were you able to learn and adapt from the information you were given, allowing you to close things out quickly with those two and a half rounds, leaving you with plenty of time to decide if you want to play again. Quicksort is simple, quick, and satisfying. And if you want to do much more, there is a forever mode that just keeps going. This one does away with the teams and is an excellent spin on the main quicksort mechanics. You're fed a category, blocks start falling, you attempt to sort them, same as usual. But now, at the end of a round, your blocks crystallize. If you found any streaks, they'll break apart, much like Tetris. And with the next round starting, you now have to place your blocks around these solidified past placements. I stacked things way too high to one side and was fighting to work around that the remainder of the time. I covered the trash, hoping that I would find a streak and luckily managed to break that apart and have the dud answers fall away. And I immediately lost one block into the next round because I had stacked things too high in the middle. I was playing alone, but you can still play this one as a group. It creates all these additional considerations and really emphasizes the component of the game where you're working against yourself. This is an excellent additional game mode. I really do like it. When you sit down with your friends, you can ask, do you want to play against each other or work together, and it's really impressive how well the game works in either manner. So it adds a lot to Quicksort and the Jackbox pack as a whole, since there's nothing else very cooperative feeling. There's not much more to be said with this one. It's simple, achieves pretty well everything it needed to, and is generally quite fun. One drawback could be that there's quite a lot of sitting around while you wait on the other team, but it can be fun just to watch the other team stress out and make mistakes along the way. You have the option to play this Feed the Monster minigame to keep your phone awake, but you're literally just tapping your phone. There's nothing to it or any payoff whatsoever, so it's pretty pointless. I feel like each player players should be given a one-time power-up to use in either of the two rounds. Half your team should be given things you can throw at the other team during their turn. Make their blocks fall faster, the word on the block is written backwards, the next block is extra tall so it gets in the way, and the other half of your team has things that will benefit you. Slowing the blocks down, undoing the last one you played, simple one-time use things to keep things a little bit more engaged on both ends while each team is performing. It's already an excellent game, but something a little bit more interactive like that would have really taken it over the edge for me. I also have no clue how many unique prompts and categories there are, or whether this game will lose its staying power once you've played it enough to start seeing heavy repeats. Or an even better question, if you see size of animals come up more than once, is it always the same grouping of animals? That could help keep things really fresh. Based on my current experience, I liked it a lot and can give it a generous 8.5 out of 10.
Before getting to my final thoughts, I need to talk about the newly introduced moderation tools. This is a feature added to the Party Pack 9 for the sake of anyone streaming this on the likes of Twitch or YouTube, and who intend to allow randos to join in on their game. Not just in the audience, as that doesn't really require moderation to have them actually participate in the games. These mod tools can work extremely well, however, they must be set up before going live. I thought I could use them at my discretion whenever I needed, and I had someone tank a game I was trying to start by joining in with an offensive name. I tried to open up the tools to kick the player, realized that wasn't how it worked, had to shut down the entire game, make the stream private, set up the moderation tools, and go back live. It seems kind of silly to me that something as simple as kicking a player out of a room can't be done on the host's end whenever you feel like, but hey, just plan ahead, give yourself 5 or 10 minutes to play around with them before making things public, and you shouldn't have any issues. Although, a knock against Jackbox, they should at least have more than the bare minimum filtration in place at this point. We're nine packs in, and streaming has been a major consideration of the last three or four. If someone names themselves the N-word with a single space in the middle, that should not bypass their censorship. You probably can't foresee every single way people will attempt to get around things, but come on. I would say the main drawback of these moderation tools is that they appear to be most effective when you have an extra person who is dedicatedly overseeing the moderation page. I was somewhat able to do it myself with a dual monitor setup, but if you don't have that or don't have someone willing to moderate but not actually play these games, you may be left somewhat stuck. So small streamers might not get as much use out of these moderation tools as those with a full moderation team already looking after their chat. It's a little limiting, it's a good starting point, and I hope that they continue to iterate on it in future packs. And I do need to share that one time in Junktopia, I got stuck in an endless loop of awaiting moderation. When that happened, my only option was to shut down the game and forcibly restart things, which I had already just done 20 minutes earlier when someone joined the game with the N-word as their name. So everyone who had already joined was booted, and when I reopened things, they weren't guaranteed to get their spots back, and the first 10 minutes of Junktopia we had already played was a total waste of time. That's a huge buzzkill midstream, and the viewership kind of plummeted while I fought against these technical difficulties. So instead, I had to do the rest of the stream without moderation tools because I was scared of that happening again. I was streaming this a full week ahead of the game's official release, so it could have been a temporary glitch, hopefully that's not a recurring problem, it could be something they're aware of and have already fixed. As I'm summarizing things, bringing them to a close, I want to acknowledge how polished these packs have felt for years now. There's a consistency and a reliability that's pretty undeniable at this point. And this year, I'd like to especially call attention to the music. I love that they now include five original credit theme songs with their own unique lyrics. That's just a joy and very funny. But holy cow, this soundtrack slaps. Seriously, like wall to wall, I think it's Jackbox's strongest soundtrack. So kudos to the team for continually finding new ways to raise the bar. Non-sensory was basically perfect in my eyes. I could nearly recommend the pack for that game alone. Include the absolutely excellent Fibbage 4 and Quicksort despite some minor shortcomings each, and those three games make it a must-play for Jackbox fans. Rumorang, I think, will divide people. It'll be a sell point for some, but I don't intend to put many hours into it. And while Junktopia isn't bad, it doesn't live up to its potential in a way that very specifically frustrates me, but I think even when I put aside the fact that I would rather it be something different, as is, it's still okay. There is nothing truly bad in this pack, and while I think some games won't stream as well as others, the addition of the moderation tools means that this could actually become an overall better streaming experience than any other pack once you get used to them. I didn't talk much about the audience's involvement in each game. They're always given something to do, although it certainly matters more to some games than others. To me, the audience participation is a cherry on top 
for the streaming community, but it doesn't factor into my final rankings, because the primary way I always play these games is with friends either in person or remotely. Looking at the all-time Jackbox rankings, number 7 remains my all-time favorite with 6 coming in in 2nd, but the fact that there's no rotten games really dragging down the Party Pack 9 and a few standouts have jumped it all the way to 3rd place for me. And looking at the completed ranking, you'll see the top 5 packs include the 4 most recent Jackbox Party Packs. They've been absolutely killing it for years now. And while I can be super critical of things, it's still as much fun to dig into this new pack as it has been for the last few years. I know it must be tough to create five original games every single year. I can't wait to see what they do with the 10th pack, and I think a fun way to shake things up would be for it to be five sequels. How great would that be? Bring back all the fan favorites, rework old concepts that didn't quite work, shake things up and create this ultimate pack that's a must play. I'm going to propose my own choices for such a pack, based on games I enjoy or see a greater potential within. My own perfect sequel pack would be Trivia Murder Party 3, Bidiots 2, Monster Seeking Monster 2, Bomb Corp 2, and Quiplash 4. Then we would have a trivia game, a drawing game, a social game, a cooperative game, and a witty writing game bringing back one of the all-time classics. But regardless of what direction they go, I'm still looking forward to it. Let me know what you think of this pack, my final ratings and rankings, and what games you would include in a pack of five sequels. I'll include a playlist in the end cards of myself and friends playing Jackbox games together, including each game in this new pack. And I hope to see you all again next year.